And it looks a little funny because it's in the middle of the parcel and I think the next map will uh, give you some explanation. This is out on Dover Road, approximately 3,200 feet east of US Highway 79 Dover Road and Liberty Church Road intersections. This is in County Commission District number seven. The applicant's statement is this zoning request is part of a comprehensive plan to develop the Lisenby Farm with an appropriate mix of uh, comparable, compatible uses. When doing our final land use plan, we ended up with a small unusable tract of land zoned R4 and we're requesting this to be zoned so it can be added to the adjacent tract of C5. This is in the urban growth boundary. Uh, this property's already been master planned. We have a approved uh, apartment complex as well as a single family subdivision. We have not seen the commercial site plan of this yet, uh, but let me see if this works. Uh, you can kind of see my cursor. One of the roads would come in around this way and this way over here. It was gonna cut off uh, this from the rest of the R4, so there was no sense having 10 or 12 apartment units across the street from the rest of the complex. So their request is just to try to shore things up, square it off to their future plans that they have changed in the last couple of years. And I'm sure the agent will be here uh, to discuss that. Uh, here's the property on the right. 374 intersection is to your back. And here it is, uh, other way as you're heading out of town. There are no department comments or concerns with this request. Staff does recommend approval. The proposed request is consistent with the land use plan. The proposed zone change is due to a minor adjustment of their development plan and the adjustment is not significantly changed or the overall development plan for the property and adequate infrastructure serves the site and no adverse environmental issues were identified relative to this and the Planning Commission also recommends approval. Thank you, sir. Any questions for Mr. Tyndall? Seeing none, is there anybody here that would like to speak in favor of CZ 15 2023? Please state your name and address. You'll have three minutes to address the commission. Uh, I'm Lawson Mabry, 115 uh, West Glenwood Drive. Uh, I think Jeff uh, explained it fairly well. I'd be happy to answer any questions if anyone has any. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Would anybody else like to speak in favor of CZ 15 2023? Seeing none, would anybody like to speak against CZ 15 2023? Seeing none, we'll move on to CZ 17 2023. Mr. Tyndall. CZ 17 2023 is the application of Runamuck Outfitters. This is 6.44 acres, currently zoned ag with an H1 overlay and requesting to go to ag commercial with H1 overlay. And I'll describe uh, what H1 is here, right here. We, uh, most of us know that the city has historic zones. Well, the county does have a few historic zones and this is the Port Royal Historic District. Everything there you see hatched in the black hatching there uh, is considered in the historic district. Um, in the county. So there are some design guidelines that would happen in these properties uh, around the historic town of Port Royal. So that is not changing. They are not taking it out of the historic district. It's not going to alter the historic district. It's going to stay with a historic district. Uh, they are requesting to go from ag to ag commercial though for this piece of property. It is not an extension of the ag commercial. Attractive land border, bounded by the Red River and south and east of Port Royal Road, approximately 800 feet north of Port Royal Road, Old Clarksville Springfield Road intersection. This is in County Commission District 19. It's a grassland area located in the Port Royal Historic District, bounded by the Red River to the south and encumbered by FEMA floodplain. The applicant did not give a statement uh, for the use on their application, and this is uh, really on the edge of the county. Uh, that's Robertson County right there on the right where you don't see the colors on the zoning map, um, and it is in the rural area. This is the FEMA floodplain from the properties out there in the area, and you can see this property is uh, nearly 100% or more than 100% uh, encumbered on those maps. 
Uh, here it is as you head towards the bridge. The property is there on the left, uh, just past that fence line. Just a little higher view of the current operation. And then to the left, there's also a commercial building there. And you can see that the current operation is zone C1 with the building next to it. <clears throat> Department comments or concerns. Uh, this is from the uh, County Building Code Department. It lies within an A flood zone. A flood zone development permit will be required and a flood study may be required depending on the use. Uh, no other department comments or concerns were received. Staff does recommend disapproval. The request is inconsistent with the land use plan. The adopted land use plan states that a concentration of our communities past by preserving a unique aspects of the built environment as well as those of nature. The sites of pioneer outposts and our river accesses to include the Red River should be maintained and retained as the critical historic settings that put our community on the map. There are adjacent parcels to the north of this request that are currently zoned commercial and under the same ownership, one of which is vacant and in need of rehabilitation. Rehabilitation or removal of deteriorated structures within existing commercial zones should be prioritized over creating new commercial districts that are encumbered by the floodplain. Additional encroachment of commercial uses in close proximity to the Port Royal State Park or National Trail of Tears Historic Trail have significant potential negative impacts on the area. Um, and we do have one more comment. Um, I think we've softened our approach on this a little bit. During the historic and environmental review, the state park official for Port Royal State Park identified what appears to be an Indian mound on the site, uh, which, was not uh, which is not an Indian mound, but instead a pile of dirt when they dredged out the canoe access point to the river. Planning Commission also recommends disapproval, and I'll take any questions. Commissioner Shelton. I, I'm going to be the dummy here tonight. What is the benefit of the H1 zoning there? Why, why would someone want to do that on a, on a property that is underwater several times a year? What is the benefit of the H1? Uh, that's, a di that's a distinction that the county uh, zoned the properties out there, and I'll go back to that map. Uh, many, many years ago. Uh, it's a historic district with the state park and the historic uh, Trail of Tears uh, uh, trailhead out there. This means that anything that gets built on these properties has to go through the Regional Z Historic Zoning Commission at the Regional Planning Commission. Prior to any approval by the Planning Commission, they have to approve it first. So it's just an extra step for uh, the historic character and appropriateness of anything gets built. So. Should anything get approved uh, on this property and they want to build or find a way to build in the flood zone, whatever structure it is would have to go to the Regional Historic Zoning Commission first for its cultural appropriateness there, um, type of materials, what it looks like, and that um, goes, it goes for any of those properties you see there on that map. Commissioner Farrar. Can you elaborate a little bit on, um, I've been to a few planning commission meetings and there's some discussion that happens there and sometimes it could be helpful to us to understand what the planning commission, what their strong points were to disapprove it and, and also I'd be interested in knowing under what circumstances would a zoning change, would it change you know, the, the Planning Commission's position? Are there any zoning changes that they would consider? Well, if you can say that. Yeah, I, I can't really answer that last question and answer for the nine of them, but uh, I think the general gist, if you watch the meeting or were there, is that uh, yes, there are other commercial ventures there that the applicant is currently using it for parking and for river access, and the code department has said that is fine. They do host a, a once a year concert right now, which the code department has also said is okay on that property. Uh, the concern of the commission was by going to ag commercial does open up some other opportunities that maybe 
are not as compatible with the surrounding properties in the historic district. Uh, I do see the applicant in the audience tonight who can probably answer some more of those questions or take those questions under consideration and get back to you all. Are you able to tell us what the different uses are with this zoning change if we were to approve it? Uh, sure. Uh, and, and of concern for the staff and the Planning Commission, I'll say, is the one that comes to campgrounds and RV parks, which are permitted, not even permitted with review. So uh, when you're permitted with review, it means you'd have to go to the County Board of Zoning Appeals and have a separate hearing, and they get to determine whether or not that's appropriate. Ag Commercial allows campgrounds and RV parks permitted all the time. Uh, and even though, and this is counter to, counter to what makes sense here, um, because you're in a floodplain, you can still have a campground. So thought is, when if we know it's going to flood, we'll get everyone out of there, let it dry back out, we can go use it as a campground again. I think uh, the, the campground that's up there off Guthrie Highway, off Spring Creek Valley Road, or whatever that road is mm -hmm. back there, that's actually in the floodplain yes. as well back there. So uh, that was the big concern, is that this area we felt and that the Planning Commission felt doesn't need to necessarily become a campground year-round. Commissioner Bill. Thank you, Mayor. Jeff, you may have already answered my question, but did the applicant actually give a proposed use? Because I'm seeing on the report it says none given. So did they give anything after the report was issued or? That is correct. Uh, there was none given. Uh, they also could not make the Planning Commission meeting, so I, I do know they're here tonight, and uh, hopefully they can package up all the questions that are being stated now and, and answer them when it's their turn to speak. Commissioner Gannon. Thank you, Mayor. I have two questions on your staff recommendations, on specifically number three and number five. Can you elaborate a little bit more on number three? on so number three and i'll just repeat it there are adjacent parcels to the north of the request that are currently zoned commercial under the same ownership one of which is vacant and in need of rehabilitation rehabilitation and removal of the deteriorated structures with an existing commercial zone should be prioritized over creating new commercial districts that are entirely encumbered by the floodplain uh, in simple economics you would say uh, let's not create something new before we max out what we have out there already. Uh, there's already a C1 zone parcel just north of this that can do a majority of what we think the applicant wants to do, again, without a stated use. Um, and we would like to see that obviously used before we make more commercial districts out there in the same area. Uh, under number five, that was your other question? Number five, it's, I'm, I'm specifically working at, looking at the word illegal. Yeah, that illegal was the word. Done. That you, was the you word You kind of the danced around park. that on the second part when you were saying it. So if it was illegal, if it is illegal, is it illegal or what they did? So the dredging may have been illegal. I don't okay. think it was done by these property owners okay. uh, or the current owners. That was the word used by the state park official, not by the planning staff. Okay. So if it was done illegally, why hadn't it been reversed? That's a great question for the... State Park. Yeah. Thanks. Any other questions for Mr. Tindall? Thank you, sir. Is there anybody here that would like to speak in favor of CZ 17-2023? Please come to the podium, state your name and address, and you'll have three minutes to address the commission. Uh, my name is Jason Pennington, uh, 1029 Main Street, Pleasant View, Tennessee. Um, I'm the owner of Runamuck Outfitters located at 3011 Port Royal Road. Wanted to just speak on um, the property up for rezone uh, from ag to ag commercial. Just kind of wanted to paint a little picture of, of what the plan is for the future use of this property. So currently it's a six and a half acre, roughly six, six and a half acre field that we mow every week and we use this overflow parking for our current business, uh, which is a canoe and kayak uh, livery where we do trips and, and whatnot on our Red River. Um, we also want to just kind of create something that's beneficial to the community. Again, here we are, we're just mowing six and a half acres every week. And we can't do much with it other than watch cars park on it. We would like to be able to build maybe an open air pavilion to be able to give the opportunity for families, for church groups, for 
whoever it might be to use the property, to be able to um, have family reunions, to have picnics. As a kid, we used to be able to go there. My grandparents, back in the, the 40s, used to go to Port Royal. Uh, I remember as a kid having picnics and gatherings down at the river. Uh, we want to be able to create something like that. Uh, in regards to the campground, that's not really that's not really what we're wanting. I think that's more than we what we want to even try to deal with is is a campground. Um, so again, just w the goal here is to create something that's beneficial to the community. As we know, it's growing out in that direction. Uh, we do um, like. The, the gentleman here said we do host a, uh, a yearly festival called the Banking Festival, which raises money for women and uh, children and charities here in Montgomery County. And, and to date, after three years of hosting the uh, festival, have, they've been able to donate over $60,000 to local women and children's charities in our community here in Montgomery County. So we want to be able to offer that option up to people as well to be able to do that. Um, so, as we continue um, moving forward, again, addressing the gentleman's concerns about fixing the dilapidated properties, we want to be able to think ahead. And so, we were trying to go ahead and move forward with getting the rezone so that we, we cross our T's and we dot our I's for any future things that we might do out there. So, um, and again, I'm, I'm glad they were able to dispel. It's not a, a Native American burial ground, and it, it was from the original owner when they dredged out the property or dredged out the. the Thank you, sir. Would anybody else like to speak in favor of CZ 17 2023? Please state your name and address. You'll have three minutes to address the commission. Good evening, everyone. My name is Hunter Stapp, 3931 Trough Springs Road, Adams, Tennessee. And um, I am uh, the other owner of Runamuck Outfitters. And so I just want to echo what, uh, what Jason was saying. And, you know, we, what it comes down to is uh, we love our community and we love being a part of it. We love being able to offer things that, um, that, that, that bring life, bring culture, bring, um, bring just a, a good experience. And, um, and that's all we're hoping to do with this. You know, we have no... Uh, huge design to develop it. Uh, we want to keep it open air. We want to keep it mostly a field. Uh, as you can tell, because of the floodplain, there's not a whole lot we can really build on if we wanted to. You know, but what we are hoping to do is to offer more events uh, for the community. We want to keep it rural to set in with the rural setting uh, that it's in. Um, so we're not planning on changing any of that. You know, what we want to do is, is to bridge the rural part of the county with the growth that's coming out on Rossview Road. And so we want to be able to offer things like farm, a farmer's market and a farm stand and things like that. And uh, I got married about a month ago. And, uh, and we had an outdoor wedding with pavilion, lights, the whole nine yards. And while we were there, uh, I, I just kept thinking, man, we could do this on, on our property as well. And so that's what we'd like to do is be able to, um, to be able to offer a, a space for, for people to have life events. And so um, we appreciate your consideration and, and uh, you know, by, by any means, we'll
commission reviewed the documents from the street, uh, sorry, county highway supervisor. Uh, they have no objection. They recommend approval with no conditions. Any questions for Mr. Tindall? Any discussion on AB 6 2023? Go ahead, Mr. Tindall. And if I didn't mention, these are all at the request of the county highway supervisor. Uh, the next one is AB 7 2023. Uh, this is known as Marlowe Road off of Highway 13. Planning Commission uh, recommends approval with the condition that Marlowe Road retain the name for use as a private road for postal and 911 emergency purposes uh, with no other conditions besides that. Planning Commission also recommends approval. Any other questions or discussions on AB 7 2023? Seeing none, go ahead, Mr. Tindall. And finally, this is a request. This one by Blick. This is not by you, right? Okay, sorry. This one is by uh, application by Jonathan Blick to the County Highway Supervisor. Uh, this is for the abandonment of two portions of unbuilt road right up at the uh, Kentucky border in South Guthrie. Uh, that would allow these lots to be replatted into different lots that would uh, potentially face the road out there. Um, and allow the applicant to utilize them. Uh, Mr. Blick has an interest in all the properties you see on that prop uh, on that map there. Uh, Planning Commission does recommend abandonment with no conditions. Any questions or discussion for AB 8 2023? All right, thank that you, sir. That concludes our report. Appreciate you, Mr. Tindall. Moving into our resolutions 23-11-1, resolution to accept and appropriate grant funds from the Bureau of Justice Assistance State Criminal Alien Assistance Program for the fiscal year 2022 awards period. Any questions or discussion for 23-11-1? Seeing none, move on to 23-11-2, resolution to modify the meeting frequency of the Montgomery County Rules Committee. Any questions for 23-11-2? Seeing none, we'll move on to 23-11-3 resolution, Montgomery County Commission approving funds in the amount not to exceed $33,000 for the purpose of creating a railroad sculpture for the Montgomery County Spurline Trail. This would be public art fund dollars. Any questions or discussion on 23-11-3? Seeing none, moving on to 23-11-4, resolution appropriating the funds not to exceed $40,000 for the purpose of purchasing an enterprise uh, purchase management system to be used by payroll budgeting as well as financial planning. Any questions or discussion on 23-11-4? Mr. Burkholder. Thank you, Mayor. Would there be anyone from HR that would be able to just give us a brief overview on that software? Yes, and I can Mr. Taylor is, is probably going to be more for the budgeting side. There okay. is an HR side function to this uh, software. Um, that we have budgeted for, and this is an expansion of that software as well. But Mr. Taylor, go ahead. What the mayor said is correct. We're transitioning over to the HCM system with Oracle right now. Probably go live date it is right now around April 1st in order to do budget for budget planning purposes for the payroll side. We need this software as well to go along with it, and we need that probably. It should go live around the same time. We have existing funds in the HR budget along with accounts and budgets that will pay for the majority of it. We just need an additional 40000 to cover the remainder of it. So we're, we're changing softwares and for payroll and HR purposes, essentially, is what we're doing. This is the remainder of that. Yes, sir. Changing. We're transverse, transitioning from Tyler Munis over to Oracle for our HR. Thank you. And the, and the hope is in the future to take all financials into Oracle as well, but we're doing it in phases to make it more manageable for all the personnel. Uh, Mr. Fry, Commissioner Fry. What would happen if we waited till the next fiscal year to do this? Um, the payroll budgeting process would become a manual process at that point. This will allow us to use the data that will be entered into the Oracle's human resources system and allow us to use that information to, for budget purposes. Otherwise, it's going to be more of a manual process as far as budgeting for the entire county. 
So was there something that happened when we did this budget year that we didn't anticipate the difference? We didn't expect this to be a part of it this soon. With it going live April 1st, we need something to be able to transition over to that in order to do the budgeting for it. Okay. Good question. I asked the same one. <laughs> Any other questions on 23114? Commissioner Padro. Yes. Uh, after the purchase or the expenditure of $40,000, what are the updates going to cost? Do you have information on that? I don't have information on what the updates would cost. I would think it would be part of the agreement. I'm sure there's going to be a yearly maintenance cost. I don't remember what the, what the yearly cost was going to be for the HCM module. But I do know the updates are included in that cost, that yearly cost, and I can get that information for you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Any other questions on 23-11-4? Seeing none, move on to 23-11-5, resolution for enactment of ethics policy and compliance with state law requirements. This would, this would create an ethics uh, committee. Currently, all ethics complaints go solely to the county attorney and this would allow us to create a committee. And, and this policy is also the, the model policy that CTAS sends out to. So, Commissioner Bill. Thank you, Mayor. You answered one of my questions. So who, who would fall under the county ethics policy? Is it just those that fall under Montgomery County government? Is it every constitutional office? Is it every board and committee and what we like to call quasi-governmental bodies, are, are they all included in the ethics policy? All right. let, let, me, let me ask you to, to do this. If you, th there's, there's a lot to this in that we have to report to the state on the existence of our ethics policy. And if we adopt this policy, which has been specifically asked to be created by the legislation itself, then we simply need to say this is our policy. Going directly to your questions, it's really a fairly short ethics policy. So county is defined in section 1-1, and who it applies to is defined in section 1-2. The county means Montgomery County, which includes all boards, all commissions, I'm not gonna read the whole list, and it includes those boards we appoint, like E911, like uh, th that, that operate independently. That would be county when it's used in here. Who are the officials and employees or any official, whether elected or appointed officer, employee or servant or any member of any board, agency, commission, authority or corporation? Pretty pervasive. So really. similar to like what we did when we, uh, to allow public comments, each one of those other bodies all adopted the same stuff. So we would ask for each one of those to do the same thing once we adopt it at this level. And, and Mayor, please forgive me. You, you, you're really not, <clears throat> you're not changing very much the, the ethics policy you had in existence about 10, 12, 13 years ago. There was an ethics policy recommended by CTAS. There have been some revisions since then, but we've kind of moved away with it with a few, uh, a few committee votes and uh, we've kind of developed some ethics statements and some other policies departmentally and otherwise. And, and this simply was triggered by the fact that the state says, oh, by the way, we want everybody to tell us by January 31st of 2024, what is your ethics policy? And a lot of these, a lot of these provisions are from statutes which are already binding on you anyway. I mean, fundamentally, it's it's a minimalist approach, but it to ethics. But it's one that if you adopt this policy, we simply need to report we're using the policy that you approved CTAS to to develop. Because I know in other situations in the past, we have been told that certain constitutional offices fell under a different set of rules, 
or they were they were able to adopt their own their own procedures, things like that. So that's why I was asking, for example, the sheriff's office, would they fall under this? Would the school system fall under this? How about you know the assessor's office, all those, would they fall under this also? Okay, you've, you've actually mentioned two constitutional offices and one entity that's not related to us, the school system. It, I, I want to tread lightly because it all depends upon the kind of policy you're talking about. A personnel policy provision of one of the constitutional offices can be different from the other constitutional offices or the county as a whole. But Montgomery County needs to develop an ethics policy. If there are some additional ethics policies to be followed, they would all have to at least comply with this provision here. Okay. You know, so, so I, I think I would have to start down the funnel, but primarily when you're talking about different constitutional offices having different rules and regulations and policies, they can do so, but everybody's got to have an ethics policy. And I'm, I'm not really sure that, I'm not really sure how we've kind of developed and gotten away from the single ethics policy that we had. So this will be just like the starting point and then we'll kind of go out from there, because depending on the situation, I guess. It'll seem to me to be a kind of fresh start and then we can start looking at where other ethics comments may have fallen into another committee structure. Okay. And Mayor, my second question, when will this committee be created if approved? Will it be on the, on the December agenda, the appointments? Yes, sir. Once, once approved here. Okay. Yes, sir. Thank you. Any other questions on 23115? Seeing that, we're going to 23116, resolution authorizing the Industrial Development Board to apply site 32 AB sale proceeds to local grant match. Uh, what this one is, is this is uh, funds that have already been allocated for this purpose. They didn't get the grant that they were applying for. So this is us authorizing them to continue to apply for grants for the industrial park. Any other questions or discussion? Commissioner Bill. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, so my question on this one is, I know the, that the grant that we applied for and didn't get was for 750 but the proceeds were 971. So does this money just sit in like a reserve account with the IDB until they get approved for a grant that requires a matching and then it gets used? Or what's the, what's the process on how those funds are handled? Yes, sir, that's spot on. Can I ask Mr. De Mr. Dellinger to come up? Yes, Commissioner. So right now, we're, it looks like grants are coming out every quarter. So when we, we apply for the grant, we have to have a resolution that states that the dollars are available. And we were doing that. And if we didn't get the grant, then we'd have to, uh, you know, undo the other the resolution that we committed for one and have to recommit the dollars for the next for the next grant. And that was coming around because the state does have a lot of grant money. They're, they're pushing a lot of grants out for economic development. And it's, it's you know, just a lot of work to keep trying to, to, to be up here to commit resolutions for those grants. So the concept was that we would put this money aside and apply those two grants uh, for the next year. Since this is actually money that belongs to the county, do we get some sort of update or report on, you know, hey, this is what's going on here. Th this amount was applied to this, this amount went to this, this is what we still have. Do we get those regular updates? We have not given it. It's only recently have Can we, we had this that? many grants. Sure, we're happy to give, you know, twice a year or, you know, once a year updates on what we've been able to accomplish with our grants in the industrial park. Okay, thank you. Any other discussion on 23-11-6? Commissioner Fry. Would we be able to amend this so that in a year, if the dollars haven't been spent, then we would ask him to come back and just not let it be open-ended forever? Yes, sir. Should I make a motion now to do that, or is that next week? Thank you. If you, if you need help drafting up any language, uh, Mr. Harvey can help do that as well. 
Any other questions or discussion? Seeing none, we'll move on to 23117, resolution for broadband ready communities. Any questions or discussion on 23117? Seeing none, moving on to 23118, resolution to amend the previous resolution of 1935 to add a procedure for the identification and liquidation of surplus and obsolete property pursuant to Tennessee Code annotated 514-107 and 514-108. This was brought to us by the Purchasing Committee. Any questions or comments on 23118? Seeing none, moving on to 23119. Resolution of the Montgomery County Highway Department reclassifying one administrative supervisor to a chief deputy of accounting and administration. Any questions or discussion on 23119? Seeing none, moving on to 231110. Resolution to appropriate capital outlay funding for the purpose of purchasing a weapons detection system. And Mr. Taylor can Give us some more information on that one. From the financial side of it, th there were available funds left over from the previous um, weapons detection system at Northwest High School. These funds can be used without having to appropriate additional funds for the weapons detection system at Rossview. As far as the system goes, this one is a little bit of a test as well because at Northwest, I believe the system only affected one door, whereas this system, it'll be for three different entrances for the school system. And the school they're looking at is Ross View High School. Correct. Right. Commissioner Shelton. I would like to have the pull from the uh, contingent, please. Yes, sir. Commissioner Bill. Mayor, can I uh, defer to Commissioner Walker? He's got his hand up. Commissioner Walker. My question is, when you look at this, they, according to the sheriff's department and the school system, uh, they said this program was successful. Can we see some data that shows how many guns were confiscated, how many knives, how many brass knuckles, how many students were arrested? I mean, that's what I want to see. I want to. Where you at? Oh. Come on down, Sheriff. I, so I did meet with the, the school system and the sheriff's office as well and reviewed a lot of this data and asked some of those questions myself. Go ahead, Sheriff. Just together, um, back from the initial pilot program for Northwest with one entrance, uh, of course, since that pilot program began at the start of the school year, uh, the successes that we're saying is that there's been no uh, weapons detected or brought into the school, which is a success in and of itself. Uh, now, as far as other items, you know, there's been, uh, you know, alerts on the laptops and things like that, which is what we thought it would hit on. But uh, the uh, big thing that we've noticed was the uh, absence of uh, vapes in the schools. And I know that there's been an issue with that, but that's not what the system's designed for. Uh, but it is uh, definitely a success uh, in the manner of not finding any weapons at all coming through the system, which is exactly what we want. This keeps the weapons out of our schools. How many weapons were found before that? How many weapons were found before that? Yeah. Well, last school year there was, I don't, don't want to misspeak on the amount, I think it was four weapons that were found out of uh, two or three different schools across the county. But No, I'm just talking about Northwest. But that, Northwest, that's the only one I'm concerned with. Right, Northwest last year, I believe there was one. There was one. That's all it takes is one. Right. And I think not finding any with this system right here just is a testament to the deterrence of the uh, system itself to keep the weapons out of our school. So that's, that's the goal. Commissioner Padro. Uh, yes, Mr. Sheriff. Do you have a timeline put together as to how many schools? In other words, when are you going to reach a point where you can say, okay, all the schools have been tested? Right. And I think the big thing with, with starting this next pilot at another school is, as the mayor mentioned, it's one entrance at Northwest High School. 
A school like Rossview High School has three entrances and uh, there are several schools that are built on that same plan. So this gives us an idea of the logistics and um, you know the impact that it would have piloting at a school like Kenwood or at a school like Rossview. There's Kenwood, West Creek, uh, several other schools. There's four or five uh, other school footprints that are built on the same uh, blueprint uh, as Rossview. So, uh, if we do that bait, that test there at that school, that's going to give us a, a good feel on, um, you know, what the impact the system will have for a large number of students. You know, each one of those schools that I mentioned, uh, you know, are pushing or over a thousand students at those schools. So, uh, you know, if you look at that and put that on a scale of what we're, uh, you know, hopefully preventing or deterring from coming into the school building, uh, that's large. Yes. Thank you. And again, you know, this is something that we're uh, that we're doing that we're seeing all across the country. These systems going into place, uh, not just a system like this, but other technologies that are out there to prevent uh, something terrible from having it happening in our schools. And I think that it's uh, very prudent uh, to stay on top of that. And that's exactly what I plan to do, of course, with your support. Commissioner Bill. Thank you, Mayor. So that kind of leads into my question, and I'm not sure if it's a sheriff question or if it's a director of schools question, but I would like to know what what criteria is being used to determine, hey, we're going to put one at Northwest, and then we're going to go to Rossview, instead of doing other schools that I think probably need a more, like Kenwood High and, North, and Northeast High. Um, that's just based on my experience, the input that I get from parents, and, you know, because that's a lot of that's my district. So what is it about Rossview and Northwest that needed this before any other school, especially Kenwood and Northeast? Well, starting out with Northwest, of course, starting uh, with beta testing the program, this only required us to purchase one unit because there was one entrance at Northwest. That just made the most sense to try that out. So a school like Rossview, of course, you got the, the amount of kids uh, that attend that school, faculty and staff. Uh, logistics activity of course that, those are always determining factors and you know each school year from one year to the next is is not the same at each school building of course it's like trying to hit a, a moving target if we're trying to hit a school with the most activity but you're right you know this school year for instance there's uh, more activity at another school with the same footprint uh, but as far as a plan to uh, unfold this system if it works well at this like we believe it will uh, you know, those schools will be covered uh, by priority by incident, incidents at that school. So that's the, the plan, and I know that uh, Commissioner uh, Padre had asked that question a while ago, but uh, that's the plan for us. Of course, we need to sit down with our partners at the school system and decide what that rollout looks like, but uh, that is the reason uh, at, at Rossview is uh, the volume of, of students that go there, other logistics that go into us being able to uh, start out that program because just like Northwest we used SROs from other middle schools and, and elementary schools prior to their school start to get the program started uh, and that's the same thing there at Rossview so uh, that's that's a great deal of the reason why it was uh, going over to Rossview. Commissioner Harper. Thank you Mayor. Sheriff, quick question for you. If you could provide us, uh, this is kind of piggybacking on what Commissioner Walker stated earlier. Give us the study information at Northwest, what happened previous to the installation of the weapons detection system and what, what's been detected afterwards. I think that would help us make a good prudent decision, would help us a lot. Secondly, I'm looking at this contract, this is a four-year contract. That's correct. Typically, we budget a year at a time. My concern is we've got a four-year contract here, okay? Um, say we decide we're going to put it in every high school. Now we've got four-year contracts for each of those, and we're committing ourselves to dollars that we, we shouldn't be doing, okay? Um, we're making decisions for other commissions as a result of that. I'm, I'm real hesitant to do that, real hesitant to do that, especially given the fact that we don't even know the results of the system that we put in as a test basis. So obviously I think all of us are very concerned about safety. It's paramount on our minds. I'm very concerned about it as well, but I'm also very concerned about making sure we make prudent decisions for our, for our community 
and uh, we, we need more information before we can possibly make this decision. We also need to look at not having extended contracts over multiple years. I think that's a real concern for me. So I'd, I'd appreciate your help in getting us that information. Sure, I can do that. And looking at the data, you know, I mentioned uh, just parts of what was, was coming through, looking at the alert rate, which is the, the, the folks that walk through the system that, the, that it did alert on to check and the secondary searches, uh, you know, all of that broke down uh, from the time that we started using the system at Northwest, more than 17,000 people have come through that and the alert rate on that is 22%. But most of those items were uh, things that uh, mimicked a weapon, which is exactly what the system is supposed to detect and deter. And then items that were found uh, as a result of that, uh, you know, that did not make their way into either the, the high school or the football game uh, were things that shouldn't be in a high school uh, or a football game uh, anyway. It's not a, uh, uh, might not be a threat item, but uh, those items, again, are uh, a result of uh, not being found in a school as a deterrence for students uh, not bringing them into the school in the first place. And that is the goal with the system. If they do, we're going to find it. Uh, but uh, the goal is not to bring one in there at all. Thank you. Yeah. Commissioner Knight. Thank you, Mayor. So we've heard all the concerns. We heard all the issues. We, we heard all the questions that, you know, uh, uh, and all the information that we're requiring in regards to uh, getting data. Now, uh, as stated before, with the volume of students at Rossview, that will actually help us get really good data in reference to uh, the, ef the efficacy of these uh, weapons detection systems, for one. Two, um, I mean, Right now, parents are listening to us. Right now, our constituents are listening to us. And uh, I, for one, commend the sheriff on his proactivity in trying to promote safety within our school system. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Commissioner Leverett. Um, yes, Mayor. Um, thank you. Sheriff, I mentioned this in the budget uh, committee um, when we were going through the resolutions, but I also wanted to uh, mention it publicly. If <clears throat> your office would publish also this set data we've been asking for, if you could also put it maybe on your website so that parents and constituents and the public can go there to actually see the preventative measures in place with these systems, I think that that would give the public some reassurance and some comfort. And so um, I don't know how you would have to do that logistically with the IT team, but I would ask that you would also publish that somewhere on your site or either on the school system site if they have the capabilities as well. I think that that would definitely help inform the public. Sure, we can discuss that. And I know that at the five or six football games that we had that uh, system uh, plugged up and, and ready to use, the last one being the Clarksville High game, uh, the feedback from the public has been overwhelmingly supportive. Uh, and I know that uh, the folks that live that are living in your uh, particular districts uh, either may or may, may not have reached out to you, but, but you know, we're directly in contact with them whenever we're out with these systems at these football games, at these schools and other extracurricular activities. So there's a lot of support uh, from those families. And, uh, and I keep going back to the deterrence because uh, the system in this very building is to deter uh, someone from coming in and doing something harmful. Uh, it's the same for these schools. So if you look at that and you look at the, uh, uh, the, the positive impact that that's having for the safety of those schools, I think that it's uh, something definitely to pursue. Commissioner Gannon. <clears throat> Thank you, Mayor. Um, you've heard me talk many times on yes, all sir. this stuff. Yes, um, sir. Safety to our students is paramount, obviously, first thing. However, if, my concern on this whole thing is that I think it's setting us up to a certain extent to say this would stop something like that happened in Covenant in Nashville or any of those mass shootings. I don't, uh, when you read the manifestos and stuff, there's a lot of research that, that those criminals, I don't call them criminals, do, those bad people. Um, I would like, if you're going to do that research study part two, I would like to show somehow have you show something in that study how this detection system would have stopped that type of shooting? Because I don't think it would. 
because they broke through a glass door. And all the other ones, they find the weak spot and they break through there. They're never coming in through the front door where the weapons detectors are. So if you could throw that into your study and stuff when you do that, I would appreciate it. Thank you. Sure, and, and kind of piggybacking off what you had mentioned, you know, it's also public knowledge of this shooter at uh, Covenant in Nashville uh, visited another school prior to going to Covenant and they left that school because of the presence of law enforcement and other safety measures in place so that's a good case in point that you brought brought up that could easily uh, you know be discussed about the pros of what we're doing there at that school uh, it's not going to stop someone from uh, coming into the uh, school building from the parking lot guns blazing uh, but there are technologies and uh, things like that that I'm looking at right now to implement uh, working with evolve extend which is a, a partnership with OmniAlert, uh, which would detect weapons uh, up to 250 feet away from the front of the building so that's another part that will piggyback off this technology but uh, you know kind of what uh, commissioner knight was saying you know you have to start somewhere to improve the safety in your schools and i think piloting this uh, and then piggybacking uh, off of that with other technologies and other techniques you know in conjunction uh, you know make make our schools a whole lot harder of a target Commissioner Fry. When we uh, discussed last year about adding this to Northwest, there was <clears throat> some discussion about who would be manning these. And at the time, we thought, you know, initially it would be the SROs. But then after some training was done, the school staff would be more or less the people who was manning the, uh, the systems. And so could you speak to how that's played out and what we're really seeing at the school? Well, of course, the partnership whenever we started out was a combination of help uh, uh, logistically to, to stand up the system and to run it the way that it needs to be run based on what uh, other school districts across the country have been doing. And we've been doing that at Northwest as well. And it is a combination of SROs uh, watching the system as folks come through and directing those students that did alert over to a search table where law enforcement was also present there along with uh, school faculty and staff there that were searching the bags. Uh, this system is uh, uh, working well at Northwest that way. Uh, whenever you have three entrances at a school, uh, you know, that might change the logistics just a little bit, but uh, at, at any in any event you know law enforcement will be present uh, when folks are coming through the system and during the searches uh, with the help of the school system as well uh, we've discussed that with uh, the Rossview staff over there on what that would look like based on our pilot here at Northwest and uh, of course you want to try to have uh, things as standard as possible across the district whenever you go to implementing something like this but uh, each school building, as I mentioned before, has its own set of uh, logistics that require, uh, you know, certain, uh, you know, people helping in certain areas. So, but it is a partnership between us and the school system running this, yes. If, if I heard you correctly, we have one law enforcement watching the system and another one doing search? We have two at the high schools, and then before the elementary schools start, we have uh, elementary school SROs at Northwest helping uh, with, with kids coming into the school at the start of the school. Yeah, I mean specifically at the system, it, it sounds like if you extrapolate that, we would need six law enforcement at Rossview, two at each entrance. Right, well there's already two at Rossview, there's two at all of our high schools, but that kind of goes to the point about why Rossview, and again that go, comes down to the logistics of the other elementary and middle schools that are in the area that could help set that up. But something like this set up may require uh, more staff uh, from the school system to kind of help stand that up since there's three entrances. but. Uh, we already know what that's going to look like so and we're, we're prepared for that and the school system is committed to assisting us in making sure that that uh, that works so do we do we expect to have to hire more people to have to if we were to roll this system out that's what, what the beta test is for okay. so we can see that we can't make any inferences so far from the experience in northwest well, we can, but it, by the way that's set up, it's a law enforcement officer at each door. If you had a law enforcement officer at each door, a law enforcement officer at the search table, then that would be six law enforcement officers plus school staff, which could easily be done based on the, lo the logistics of that area and the start times of middle and elementary schools to help 
get that started. In the future, who knows? I mean, there's some uh, things that we've always done historically uh, to meet the needs of the sheriff's office, uh, not just for schools, but other areas of the sheriff's office that we've used unspent salary dollars and things like that to assist with. But it's definitely a system that, uh, you know, if we're going to commit to it, uh, before we make large investments, you know, we need to uh, do the beta test and see what that's going to look like. So that is exactly the point of this. And then we bring that back and discuss what that uh, logistics, what, what the logistics of that look like and what the costs look like uh, expanding it. Uh, uh, and to start, uh, not all the schools, high schools uh, primarily is w what the goal is right now to get them in. Is there any possibility to just close one entrance permanently and go through two that way we could see well, we could we could see more but not have to, right. to do it that way well there was four entrances there at rossview and they've agreed to cut it to three and i don't want to speak to uh, the school system and what that is but i think three logistically based on the volume of students and faculty and staff that are coming into the building is probably most uh, about as much as they they could reduce that Commissioner Padro, uh, I think it's commendable, Mr. Sheriff, that you're, you're running this program. And I don't think you can put a price on an incident like this where one innocent student gets shot. We got to keep that in mind also. I, I understand the fellow commissioner talking about cost, but what price do you put on a student? We need to keep that in mind. Thank you, sir. Commissioner Gannon. Just a quick question on clarity. Did you say that we're pulling the SROs from the middle and uh, elementary school at Rossview in order to accommodate these three machines at the high school? For, for the 30 to 45 minutes a day, well prior to when the start time is for those middle and elementary schools. Right now, they're oh, the answer is yes. schools. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Commissioner Shelton. I know we're talking about a good number of different law enforcement officers at the doors as they're going in. Um, at what point do we, does it become kind of overkill? That, that, that's one thing I tend to look at. Now, I do want to ask one question for clarity. Uh, we are seeing this is going to be a continuation of a beta test that began with Northwest. So this is the continuation of that, yes? Yes. Okay. A, um, and from there, then we make a determination on the final resolution for whether or not or how many schools down the road. So, because, okay. because the footprint is the same for several other school buildings, yes. Great. Thank you. In Any discussing staff, I just want to add one more point, if I can, Mayor. I know that a lot of districts across the country are, are just implementing these systems. Uh, a lot of school uh, systems use their own staff uh, to man these without law enforcement. Uh, we visited one up in Champaign, Illinois, and they have their own security team at the school that does that. Now, I'm not suggesting that that's what we do here, but based on the need, uh, based on the urgency here in this district, you know, we just need to be able to evaluate all that to see what it's going to take. Uh, to put these up in all of our high schools and then come back and uh, decide what we're going to do. Commissioner Harper. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Sheriff, just one thing. When I first ran for office in 2014, one of the things on my platform was to put an SRO in every school throughout the whole system. After much fighting, pulling, gnashing of teeth, we've done that. My reservation on this is that we are pulling those SROs that we worked hard to get in every school for a period of time from schools, and that doesn't enhance security, in my opinion. The, these I are prior to the start date of the school. Uh, the school has not opened yet. Folks have not started to come to the school grounds yet. And I'm going to add this, too. It's my responsibility as the sheriff to protect these schools. I'm not going to take that lightly. I'm not going to take anything to risk at any school building. So I just want to make sure that you understand that. There's no way that I'm going to put another school at risk uh, to do something like this. It's, it's not uh, during the school hours. It's well prior to the school start dates of those schools. 
I understand what you're saying, but we not all of our schools are set up as a complex. Therefore, there would be travel time when those schools could possibly be unmanned, so to speak. Not every, not every situation is a complex like Rossview is. That's something that if we want to do this, and certainly there's, you know, we all care about our students and our children. Every one of us that's on the commission, I can assure you, uh, wakes up and thinks about that every day. So that's, we are concerned along with you. We appreciate that. But I'm also looking at if we're pulling, we need to have a plan. We started it at one school. It's eliminate one weapon per your words. Um, that's a good thing. I don't have an issue with that. There was one weapon that was pulled that we didn't get, that didn't enter the school at Northwest. But what we're saying is we need to think about this strategically and let's, rather than piecemeal it together, let's talk about a plan on how we're going to implement this to safeguard our schools. And at present, I'm not, maybe I'm reading too much into this, but I'm not seeing there's an overall strategic plan to do this. Maybe I'm not privy to it, but I think all of us here on the commission should be privy to it. So. Well, there's a lot of discussion that goes on, on on any initiative that we do as far as school safety goes. We don't advertise that, of course, for obvious reasons. But, you know, this testing of this school and, and the principle of other schools being in that footprint again, go to if we're going to go further, you know, this is what the plan would be. And we do plan to sit down and, and see what this looks like for uh, expanding the program if this is as successful as it's been at Northwest. So. Uh, there are plans in place. There have been plans in place before we even bought the first unit. So, um, we're so, your partner. I understand. Help, help, I understand. Help us help you. <laughs> well, I, I understand. I understand completely. There, there are plans, and there are a lot of discussion. There is a lot of discussion that's going on about everything that we do uh, with this. And this system is expensive. Uh, you know, if you uh, look at the resolution. Uh, for these three units at Rossview High School after the first year would be a little more than $80,000 for a school year. You know, I don't know if you look at the, the, the budget for that school building and uh, divide that up by each kid. Uh, to me, uh, any member of the public that I've spoke with told me it's a no-brainer. Uh, and again, I know that they support that, and we do need to be smart, we do need to plan, and, you know, I appreciate your comment about the four-year contract. These are things that we're working out with Evolve and the mayor's office uh, about how we're going to do that going forward. I think we're all on the same page. And Sheriff, if you don't yeah. mind, I'd like to bring the director of schools up here as sure. well. Sure. Um, so Commissioner Harper, I asked the, the same question. That was the reason I, I called the meeting with uh, the school system and the sheriff's office. I wanted to know what that strategic plan and the, ro the entire rollout looked like, including Manning, what does it look like after the four-year commitment? What is the reoccurring cost after that point? Um, you know, we own the machines at that point. Do they have just a maintenance program? Because there's there's other programs that we have that are similar to this, like the, the tasers, the axon tasers, and things like that. So anytime we enter into some of those contracts, we also put a clause in there because the state basically allows us to, saying that if if this body does not fund to said contract, it's not going to be there anymore. So but those are some things that we've been looking at as well. And go ahead. So first of all, I just want to say that I had um, extreme hesitations when this first started as well. So obviously, we, we all want to focus on safety. And so we decided to start at Northwest for those reasons given. Let's try it with one. Um, first, I didn't want the perception of our students feeling like they're walking through a metal detector every day. That has been alleviated. So if any of you walk through f and Arena or anywhere else and you're just walking through and not paying a whole lot of attention, 
that is what it's like at Northwest. The goal there is we, we do have extra law enforcement currently, as mentioned, but we have also seen it does not take as many as we had feared to begin with. And we have teachers and we have administrators who are, every morning they have duty posts. And so this is one of their posts and that's where they are located. And one of the people, their job is just to be the greeter. And really the job is to put eyes on kids every day. And so as they're walking through, say, Good morning. I'm going to tell you right now that that has helped even more than I anticipated because someone is chatting with students as they walk through. Every single student who walks through every morning has a conversation with individuals and they are greeted. So first of all, that has been a bonus. Um, the, the sheriff has mentioned the deterrent. I did not anticipate this, but I am very glad about it. When we look at the number of vapes that have been um, caught and actually processed, it's 50% at Northwest, so less than half of what they have had in the past. Again, it's not a vape detecting system. That's not the intent, but it sure has been a bonus. I will tell you that. Um, the number of incidents that we've had when we talk about discipline has decreased. We don't know what it is all prevented. Um, the reason we are really asking for Rossview, you ask about other schools. First of all, I want to be very transparent. I don't want this to look like um, I'm, I'm, I'm targeting certain populations or certain sides of town. I want to be very clear. I want to be at the biggest school we have with the most entrances because if we can figure it out and make it work there, we can figure it out and make it work anywhere if we want to duplicate it. So that's why we're looking at Rossview. They have four entrances. Um, we are going down to three. Some of the other schools with the exact same footprint that have three entrances, we may be able to minimize that to two. I will also say the SROs that are located, that are coming from the elementary. As a former high school principal, we had those same elementary SROs coming to our campus to help us out in the mornings before school. So you have to remember, some of our elementaries, they don't start until 845. We have kids coming on our high school campuses at 645. Significant difference. I promise you, we are not going to shortchange any school. We have fought too hard to make sure we've got representation. So um, I, I will say that. And I will say also, these are schools that are very willing participants. I'm just asking Please let's try Rossview. The funds are already available now. We're already looking at funds from the school system for future things. We're looking at grants. But we don't really know. I can't say if it's a success or failure based upon Northwest alone. If we do it at Rossview and we can really look at that data, we can dig in. And then also looking, quite frankly, at the other six high schools that did not have them this year. And what does their data look like? Are we seeing weapons? Are we seeing incidents? So that, that's just my take. Happy to answer any questions you have for me, too. Commissioner Bill. Thank you, Mayor. So. Dr. Vitter, you made a comment. You said that we didn't want to give the appearance that we're targeting certain populations. I don't think that's, that, that wasn't my point in asking that. Um, based on information that I receive from school teachers, principals, school board members, uh, parents, things like that, I'm actually wondering why we're not, and maybe you are, why we're not looking at, okay, there's more of a discipline problem at this school why would we not choose that one instead of choosing Rossview? So are you looking at only Rossview's information and saying, yeah, that's a good one? Or are we looking at all the schools and saying, okay, yeah, maybe Rossview has more students, but there's, a, there's more of a discipline problem at another school. Does that make sense? Absolutely. So is that, is that what's happening? Or, or are we just saying, yeah, Rossview's a good one because we've got three entrances and logistically that makes more sense. Sure, so I will say first of all, it's the largest, you know, so it was the student number of students. I will also say that when you look historically, there have been incidences at a number of schools. So um, I will say that. I will also say that we as a school system are, are looking at Rossview as the next step because that's the conversation, but we are also looking at other dollars we may potentially have to work in tandem that essentially we may be able to extend this pilot ourselves during the spring semester and hopefully maybe do one more building um, to, to really complete this pilot. So we are absolutely looking at other options, I promise you. Thank you, sir. Commissioner Shelton. 
Dr. Linovetta, I want to thank you very much for already answering my question. Um, some of the things that you have addressed in what you said is exactly what I needed to hear, and I know that, our, that the residents of Montgomery County are very, very thankful for what we're working on. Thank you, sir. Commissioner Gannon. Thank you, Mayor. I just got one more question for Sheriff Luson. Since you said we've mapped out this and are planning for implementation in other schools and you've kind of looked at expanding this program, how many additional SROs do you anticipate we'll have to hire when we get these implemented? We haven't gotten that far yet. So you don't know the answer to that question? I would like to know the answer to that question when you fill out the other stuff as well. Because if you've looked at it and implemented, you know the staff that you need, and you apparently know that you should know if you're going to need additional SROs if we implement it across the school system. We know what it's going to take to staff the entrances and staff the yeah. search tables and things like that, yes. So you won't need, you'll use staff and you won't need any more SROs. Well, hopefully that's what we can go to, yes. But the SRO well, that's is your answer. saying we don't need any more is not accurate. You know, we try to stay with the standards again, the NASRO standards on well, staff. Well, if you can include that in the site. presentation that you're doing that, that we asked for, that would be appreciated. Sure. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions or discussion on 231110? I do appreciate all the questions and discussion. It is a big deal, so thank, thank each and every one of you. Thank you, Sheriff. Thank you, Dr. Luna Vetter. So we do have everything on the consent agenda, minus 231110. Reports for approval will have the commission minutes dated October 9, 2023, the county clerk's report and notary list, the county mayor nomination and appointments for county mayor appointments. We have our public records commission, Ellen Canervo appointed to fill the unexpired term of Paula Peak with the term to expire April of 2027. For county mayor nominations, we have our veteran service organization. We have Commissioner Carmel Chandler nominated to serve a four year term to expire November 2027. Commissioner Nathan Burkholder nominated to serve a four year term with term to expire November 2027. And Tina England nominated to fill the unexpired term of Doug Heimbeck with term to expire 2024. And um, Doug Heimbeck recently passed away and are, we are praying for his family. Next we have verbal reports. School board liaison, Commissioner John Gannon. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, the school board met, <coughs> obviously, twice last month. Um, there wasn't a whole lot going on. It was kind of a slow, slow period for the school, I guess, with fall break and things of that nature. Uh, things that were happening on the formal meeting, we had points of pride. They recognized their National Merit Scholar, Scholarship semifinalists from Clarksville and Rossview. Um, again, they awarded the 2023 National Blue, Blue Ribbon School for the Middle College at APSU, which is a huge deal, a, a great national recognition that that's outstanding. Uh, and they also recognized the Legion of Valor Bronze Cross for their achievement winner in there as well. Things that they covered under policy monitoring, they looked at financial planning and budget, and they looked at learning environment and student discipline safety. Reports that were given, they did the ESSA account ability data, they did the Tennessee Ready High School data, and they also did the district, TISA district accountability. Uh, they will meet tomorrow night. If you'd like to attend, we'd like to have you over on Gracie Avenue. Six o'clock is when the meeting starts. If you need any information, you can go to their website, cmcss.net, and find all the information on the school that you would ever want to know. Thank you. Thank you for your report, sir. Highway Liaison, Commissioner Ricky Ray. Thank you, Mayor. The Highway Committee met on October the 30th. The paving has been completed on Chapel Hill and Lock B South and now they're working on the shoulders. And last week they paved the convenience center off of Ferry Road at Round Pond. That's been completed. The mowing crew on right of ways are finishing up the fifth round. They've also started demo on old buildings at their present site, getting ready for the new building to be built. They had 47 work orders turned in for the month. 61 were completed. Some were completed from the previous month. They have two job openings and the bridge crew. Uh, the bridge on Rawlings Road down in the Dotsville area will start in the spring of 2024. Contractors are already in place to start that job. And then the Chapel Hill Seven Mile Ferry Bridge is their main concern and they're working on it right now. And the next meeting will be 
November the 27th. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you for your report, sir. Next, we have uh, Health Council, Commissioner Jason Knight. Uh, thank you, Mayor. The Montgomery County Health Council met October 17th. We voted in a new member, the director of the Child Advocacy Center and POST. We received a presentation uh, from Stephanie Vance of UT Extension on the Thrive Project, which provides information and educates individuals on vaccinations due to declined vaccination rates in 2020. Uh, their goals are to develop tools and educational materials for outreach in all 95 counties. Uh, we also discussed having and updating the Health Council newsletter to place on the county website. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, sir. Airport liaison, Commissioner David Shelton. The airport, lead, uh, the airport authority met on October 25th of this year, and uh, they have been dealing with some kind of ups and downs, but the, the, the strength of the airport expansion is really kind of the big news here. They have uh, continued to have high fuel sales, and they continue to grow and build and build. We have opened three new T hangers, and those are hangers that can show airplanes wing by wing like that. Very, very efficient use of space. Uh, a third hangar has also been completed and uh, taken occupancy that just this past August. So we continue to grow, we can continue to build with new aprons that's gonna be built next year. So we are seeing a lot of tremendous activity. Um, most of the activity right now has been on getting some repairs done on some, some of the main equipment that they have for lawn mowing. But the next meeting will be held on January 31st. Thank you for your report, sir. Next, we have reports filed, building codes monthly reports. The Clarksville, Montgomery County, is that the rail authority? Regional airport, first quarter FY24 report and the trustees report. Next, we have announcements. Montgomery County Veterans Services will be hosting the annual Veterans Day Parade on November 11, 2023. Opening ceremony will be held at 9 a.m. at the historic courthouse steps with the parade beginning at 10 a.m. This year's theme is a salute to veterans and law enforcement. The Clarksville Montgomery County Christmas Parade will take place on Saturday, December 2nd, beginning at 5 p.m. Any commissioners who want to ride on the county float need to contact Emily Matthews in the mayor's office. And we would also like to recognize um, our county commissioners who have served and our veterans. If, uh, if you are a veteran on the county commission, please stand. We would like to say thank you for your service and thank you for to continuing to serve your community. If, uh, if the commissioners who are veterans would like to stay afterwards, we would like to get a picture with you all and continue to recognize your service. Um, also yesterday was Jeremiah, Commissioner Jeremiah, Pastor Jeremiah, Chaplain of the Commission, Chaplain of the VTC's birthday yesterday. <laughs> Happy birthday, sir. And if nobody has anything else, oh, Commissioner Leverett, come on in there. <laughs> Thank you, Mayor. I'd like to also invite um, the mayor, um, any county employees, and the county commissioners tomorrow in the fantastic District 5, the best district ever. We have a <laughs> unveiling at 1 p.m. from one of our local artists, David Smith. It's across the street from the Cats on Commerce. He is doing a mural unveiling, and so we want to invite you all out to uh, enjoy that. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. I will be there. Anything else for the good of the organization? Seeing none, we are adjourned. Thank you.